But part of the catch is, I guess to answer that question, the question was on the end of last recording, you know, uh, the, the cash for monitors is supply side economics agrees with Republican philosophy. The Keynesian economics agrees with Democratic philosophy. There is no political party in the middle. So there is no real political support for monitors. There might be some libertarians who probably go that way or something like that, but there's just where we're a two-party system and only a two-party system, there's no room in the middle. 20 years from now, when the Republican Party actually self-destructs and ends up splitting into two and you end up with a traditional Republican and the new Republican, then you may find that group in the middle drifting more toward monitors. But we'll talk about that later because Huh? Republican. Because we don't have Donald Trump ain't Republican. He, he he's not a Republican. Republicans are where he, the Republican Party now is. Oh, Democrats. Young people tend to vote Democrat. Uh, minorities tend to vote Democrat. Females tend to vote Democrat. Those three groups are growing faster in the country than males and white folk are doing. And so, old. And old. <laughs> so what's ended up happening? The groups of people that tend to vote Republican year after year are becoming a smaller piece of the pie. And I said back in 2015 to 2016 was the last chance that the Republicans had, I felt, was their last chance to get the White House. Because this is, the trends keep growing. As the demographics keep changing, the group of voters that the Republican message tends to appeal to is just going to get smaller, smaller, smaller. And I'm like, the Republican Party is going to A, have to redefine itself, which means it ain't the Republican Party again, or B, it's going to end up completely dying. And what did we end up getting? Donald Trump, he wasn't preaching a Republican, pure Republican message. And he something so Republican did not win in 2016. And the Republican Party is going to need to drift closer to the middle to be having a message that more closely appeals to the wants and needs and values of women, minorities, young people. And what we ended up getting, not so much in 2016. And if that group continues going on, they're going to keep drifting more and more to the right, okay. But then that leaves a whole bunch of people in the middle. They got another. Who are we going to vote for? The lesser of two evils. And then that group is going to get tired and feel even more and more and more disenfranchised. And we got to so, say the one person that was going for the middle got voted out of the primaries. Well, I guess I don't want to say middle, middle, but like try to really, really like hone in on the younger people. Oh, um, and which one you? Casey Carter. Bernie. Oh, nope. Well, he, uh, well, the oh, no, Bernie. No, he was talking to less than Hillary. That's yeah. Hillary, yeah. as a Democrat, a lot of people, you know, they, they threw, especially with Bill, they threw the, oh, you're liberal. They, threw, they turned the liberal into a cuss word in the 90s. But they were toward middle for Democrats. There's a whole lot of Democrats who are a whole lot more liberal than Clinton's were. Bernie is much more liberal than, farther to the left than, Hillary won. I was so, saying appealing to the younger people. Yeah. And he did message his message really appealed to the younger people, but not so much to some of the other groups. And which we talked about this in my marketing class the other day, is what did Hillary do? She so thought she had she had the young people in her pocket, she had the minorities in her pocket, she had women in her pocket. Who was she campaigning to? Who was she campaigning message to? She's aiming for the people in the middle, and she ignored her base. And so the, her young people were not inspired like they were in 2008 and 2012. Young people were not going out and voting. They weren't motivated. They weren't inspiring. I heard, I heard several stories of people that they wanted to go to Democratic campaign headquarters somewhere and volunteer and do stuff, but A, you couldn't find them, and B, when you could, they told you, no, we don't have anything for you to do. There weren't many signs in people's yards and that kind of stuff because they were running a top-down campaign 
where the campaign headquarters, wherever it was located, Washington or Arkansas or whatever, they were coming up with the TV commercials and messages. They were sending it out instead of what Obama did, his campaign, with his grassroots because the people were behind him. And you wanted to help the campaign, come on, we'll get something for you to do. And every, just about every yard in 2008 had some politician sign in. 2016, no. You didn't see that by either of them. They just lied. So, yeah, they just, she missed talking to her own people. She thought she had them in bag, and she's like, uh -uh. she's trying to run the table, and she got the basics. And she she didn't appeal to her party. So, what ended up happening? Young people stayed home. They weren't going to vote for Trump. Well, they didn't end up voting for her either. She knew they weren't going to vote for Trump, so she's like, they ain't going to vote for Trump. They didn't vote for her either because they weren't inspired. They weren't motivated. They didn't care. They would rather sit at home and play on Snapchat or Instagram or whatever it was that they did. She said, I actually don't have to vote. But anyway, so that's politics for five minutes. That has nothing to do with one. It's like, like, okay. Okay. Really? So, um, monetary policy. Fiscal policy was the government messing with how much they're going to spend and how much they're going to tax us as far as how we would impact our spending to try to manipulate the economy. Monetary policy is trying, this is a fine tuning a little bit. Instead of talking about their spending, they're changing the money supply in the interest rates. That's still the government. It's still the government. But it's a part of the government we'll talk about on the next slide. It is, but they're like messing with the money supply and interest rates. They're getting kind of technical here. Sitting so there, Donna talk about, oh, let's spend some money and build some bridges and fix the school. This is the, well, let's do the math to figure out exactly how many Benjamins and George Washingtons we need to have floating around in the economy and how fast are we getting spent and. That's a good kind of technical stuff here. And I just remembered a couple of things from the chapter that I just skipped. So, okay. The people that do this is the Federal Reserve. Not Congress, not the White House. The Federal Reserve is an independent government slash non-government entity. But they're the ones that determine monetary policy. These are economic professionals that look at the economy and decide what do without politics in mind, what should monetary what should the money supply be, what should interest rates be? They're the professionals. These are doctors, not Fox News opinion people making a medical diagnosis here. That's what's going on here. Federal Reserve, we talk about them a little bit in, what, what chapter was this? 14? 15. 15. Okay, in chapter 14, we skipped it. Hopefully, it will come back to, but I want to make sure that I get this in one other chapter, and then if we have time, we'll come back to it. But it's, it's a short one. Uh, the Federal Reserve serves as a central bank for the United States. It's a bank. And just like you go to the bank, you want to borrow money or something like that, you go to the bank and the professionals are going to do what? They're going to look at your financial situation and they're going to be making recommendations about how much you can borrow, what you can't borrow, and what interest rate you right? They're financial professionals here. Federal Reserve is the same thing. They're the ones that determine monetary policy. And they don't have to worry about getting reelected because they're not appointed by, well, chairman of the Fed is appointed by the president and confirmed by the Congress, but they ain't up for re-election, so they ain't got to worry about making, just like the Supreme Court, they ain't got to worry about making people happy and worry about getting re-elected and keeping their jobs. As the central bank, the Federal Reserve has a few jobs. Just, the first is it is the bank for a bank. If you have extra money, what do you do with it? You put it in a bank. Well, what does a bank do if it has extra money? It can make those deposits with the Federal Reserve. We've got extra money that we don't need. We can't lend it out because people aren't borrowing it. So let's deposit it in the savings account with the Federal Reserve and earn a little bit of interest on it. Or if you have a bank that needs money, we need money because we got people banging out of doors saying, give us a loan, give us a loan, give us a loan. Are we open a drawer to Zeppi? Well, we can borrow money from the Federal Reserve and lend it out. 
So it is the bank that a bank would use to do that same uh, cash flow stuff that you and I use a bank for. And they charge them interest. Oh, yeah. Yes. They charge interest. Uh, it is the banker for the federal government. Pull out your dollar bill and somewhere on the back of it, it says Federal Reserve Notes. They are the bank system, just like beating to your benchmark or whatever is your bank. They are the bank that the federal government uses when Uncle Sam is writing a check. It's through the, the Federal Reserve is the bank there. They control the money supply and they set regulatory functions for the financial industry. They determine some rules about, I don't know if you've heard about stress tests for banks. After the financial collapse in 2008, they're coming back and they're setting some extra rules for banks. They have rules for banks determining how much, when you and I put money in a savings account, why does the bank want us to put money in a savings account? So they can give it other people. So they can lend it to other people and draw interest on it. But how are you going to feel if you put money in a savings account and you go to the bank tomorrow and you want some money? We have some of your money and the bank says, sorry, we ain't got any. We lend it all out. That's not the You'd be kind of mad, right? Mm -hmm. So there's rules in place about the bank can't lend out 100% of the money that people deposit. The government, the Federal Reserve, is going to say what that reserve is, what they call it, how much of the deposits they, the bank has to hold in reserve to make customers happy if they come back and say, I'd like money out of my savings account, please. I'd like my money out of my account. So they set rules like that. There's rules for how much of the money, what the, what the bank can do with the money that you and I deposit there. They can't lend it to people. They can't lend it to businesses. But in most cases, they can't use it to go out and buy stocks on the stock market. There are some rules for the things that they can and can't do. And depending on the nature of the financial institution, more or less rules about you. There's even some. Some of them, they can buy stocks and hold them as a pool of stocks that they're selling, so it's a bank and brokerage house at the same time, but then if you're a credit union, no, you can't do that. They set all of these rules. The transition would be nice. So, how does the Federal Reserve make monetary policy happen? First is the reserve requirements that we just talked about. If they want to slow down the economy, they just tell the bank, well, y'all can't lend out as much money, y'all. Yep, you know, instead of holding on to 40% of the money that people deposit, you gotta hold on to 50% of it. That means that's that much less money the bank can lend out. And they're lending out less, what happens? Less There's less that we can borrow to buy stuff. Well, if they're lending out less, what are they gonna do? Raise their interest rates to get more money because they got to pay their bills to get more money out of the less money. See how bad they you ain't got so much money. How bad do you want it? All right. So which will also slow down the economy. So reserve requirements. How much money the bank has to keep on hand. The discount rate. This is the interest rate the federal, the federal reserve lends money to the banks for. So how many people live in Alberta? Not many. So, the bank in Alberta. How much money do you think people have deposited in savings accounts in the bank of Alberta? Not much. So, what in the world is going to happen if somebody wants to go to the bank in Alberta and say, I'd like to borrow $100,000 to buy a house? They ain't got it, right? So, the bank in Alberta has got to borrow money in order to get the money to lend to you to buy the house. And so, the federal government, the Federal Reserve, will lend money to them to do that. But if they raise the interest rate that they're going to lend to the Third National Bank of downtown Alberta, then what's that bank going to do? Sure. They're going to raise the interest rate to, for you, for your home loan, right? So if they want to slow down the economy, they can say, well, okay, Alberta Bank, we're going to lend you money at a higher rate, which means you're going to have to charge your customer more, which can slow things down like what we want. The other thing they do, this is a fun one, and I wish the, dates, the names were backwards flipped, but they're not. The federal funds rate, the Federal Reserve, sets the rate that banks lend to other banks at. And the federal funds rate is lower than the discount rate. Because the government ain't in business to be a business. The government would rather a bank borrow from another bank than for a bank to borrow from the government. But what they do is they set 
the interest rate that a bank can borrow another bank on. So the Third National Bank of downtown Alberta, they're not borrowing from the Federal Reserve. They're going to borrow from Bank of America, from BBT, from Benchmark, or something like that, and they're going to pay the lower interest rate. Assuming Bank of America, BBT, and them all have enough money to lend the Third National Bank of downtown Alberta. If they don't, then the Bank of Alberta is going to have to borrow from the Federal Reserve and pay a higher interest rate than discount rate. But if they, if the BBT or whoever has the money to lend to the Bank of Alberta, well, that interest rate is determined by the Federal Reserve. And if the same will, and generally it's about a quarter of a point difference. If the federal funds rate is 4%, the discount rate's going to be four and a quarter. And, uh -huh. and so when one gets raised, the other one gets raised automatically. That, that spread is just sort of going to remain. They're going to shift together. I would think all of this discount rate would go even if more weight of uh, This, that, that's just a mathematics term from time value of money. Uh, we, we talk about how money in the future is worth less than money in the past kind of thing. And it's the way that you discount that future money in terms of today's money. That's where the terminology comes from. And that's to so you say the federal, I mean the government can borrow money from the federal government, right? Yes. The, well, the government, well, from the Federal Reserve. No, from the Federal Reserve. You didn't charge the government to the federal things. Well, the, the government, the U.S. government does not borrow money from the Federal Reserve. What they do is it actually ends up coming down to this fourth point here, is the federal government is going to issue bonds, treasury bonds, T-bills, is what we call them. Um, they're usually like $10,000 is the number on the front of them. Just like they, they were just like that $100 savings bond that grandma bought you when you graduated from high school. She, she paid $50 for this piece of paper that in year 2030, this piece of paper will be worth $100. She paid 50 now, and it'll be worth 100 in the future. That means she borrowed 50 now, and or she lent the government 50 now, and they're going to pay back 100 in the future. It's sort of a preset, predetermined loan situation. And that's what happens. And the federal, so that is how the federal government borrows money, is they sell these IOUs, they sell these bonds. And what ends up happening is if the government sells bonds, they're getting cash for them. So if Paling takes a hundred dollars that I just paid her back from the loan the other day, she's like, I don't know what to do with it. And she buys this piece of paper from the government for a hundred dollars. What does she have? She doesn't have a hundred dollars anymore. She got a piece of paper, right? So the government, by selling more bonds, is getting cash out of Haley's pocket and putting paper in her hand, right? So that gets cash out of the economy. So what's she going to do? She's got $100 less than she could spend, right? Help slow down the economy. But if they want to speed up the economy, the government can say, okay, some of y'all your bonds, time to cash them in. And those are open market operations. The Federal Reserve will go out there and buy some of the bonds that the U.S. government has sold. They'll buy it from Haley, giving her cash that she can spend, and hopefully she'll spend it to speed up the economy. And that's the way they do it. If they want to slow things down, they're going to be turning around and taking some of the bonds that they have and selling them to try to get more cash out of the out of the. Work. So that is messing with the interest of the money supply by buying and selling these bonds. Reserve requirements kind of messing with money supply, messing with how many how much cash is floating around out there. Discount rate and federal funds rates messing with the interest rates. So number one and four. Money supply, two or three interest rates. This is what they're doing here. And these are all being done by professionals, not by people who are already planning their next election campaign and they haven't even been sworn into office yet. Okay. Uh, I have slides for these, so I'll just keep them that because, well, oh, no, that was Brian. Okay. I thought that was Mr. Jordan. Okay. Um, when it comes to the reserves, how much of our deposits the banks have to hold on to? Well, there's a legal reserve that is the minimum the government says you have to hold on to, but then some banks are going to have excess reserves. You say we can only lend 50%, well, we're only going to lend 40 because we want to make sure we have an extra big safety net. We're being conservative. And a lot of times you don't get this because the banks, how do they make money? Lending money, right? 
They want to take all of your money and lend it. That's why they pay you interest in order to have you put money in savings accounts. So they turn around and sell it, lend it to some other sucker for more. So that's how they make money is the difference. But banks, excess reserves have happened since 2008. Because so many banks got burned in a financial crisis. Lending money to people to buy houses that they couldn't afford, and then when they couldn't afford them, the, the bank foreclosed, and now the bank, we're bankers, and now we're stuck with a whole bunch of houses that we got to turn around and sell. And well, that's a problem because we're not real estate people, and we're in. So we've got these houses that are losing value, we need to hurry up and sell them, which is part of why the financial crisis got ugly. So now the banks are like, we got so burned last time, we're being extra careful this time. Which is why they're in 2010, 2011, 2012, even up to like 2014, they wouldn't lend you money, but you had to have really good credit. That's because the government kind of made it a law of them to take these risky loans because they can't leave out the, the people that might not be able to pay them back because they don't get these loans and they can't buy a house with it. Well, yeah, so I, yes, I'm not going to go there, but yeah, the government, there's three or four things that the government did that I. I would like to pick them to see for same thing that Hoover did as well as before the depression too, before he became president. Yes. Um, yes, now you're gonna give me the district, sorry. <laughs> but um but the banks were being extra and what we were talking to Jenny after class the other day. I liked it. I was surprised when we had the conversation with me, Bobby, Sam, Jenny, yeah, that was it. Yeah. Uh, and I said Normally, college students, y'all, every week, y'all are going to be getting a Discover Card application in the mailbox. Yeah. If, okay, some of you are. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny said she applied and was turned down. I probably, I, I should have asked the reply and said it's not recording. Because normally, uh, they want to sink their teeth in you because, yeah, they can make much money off of you now, but they want to establish relationships and then they can help you try a few years from now. But, they're being more careful now than they used to be. And she didn't qualify. She's getting a card here in a few weeks, in a week or two. So that's going to end up helping. So probably in January or February, she will be able to get a credit card from the go girl. In case you're listening, um, but the banks are being extra careful and that can slow things down. Even if the government says, well, we don't want you to slow down, we want you to, you know, they said the leave reserves, and sometimes the banks go over and above, which doesn't give them the speed up that they're looking for. Um, but we'll finish this next time because I'm uh, 45 seconds over. So what happened if the banks actually spend? So Steve, they said you know you have to have 30 percent of 